You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Let me be the child of this divorce couple that kind of like splits the middle here. I think you're right. I, live? Huh? No, not yet. Actually, you know what? Hold on. Okay. Uh, click it. Three, two, one. All right. And we're live. So, because this is a great conversation, we need to have this. Yeah. Um, I think the grassroots is there, but I also think that it's kind of like a Ponzi scheme on the upper half of it too, if that makes yeah. sense. So I agree with what, what, what Steve is saying, but I'll screw with you. Like there's a big grassroots of it, but like, I don't like the way they're running it. A great example yeah. of this is where the cost of if you truly want to be a professional millionaire, minus John Cox, your rig is going to cost $150,000, period. Like, what's what are we saying here? Like, at some point, you are, it costs more money to be a pro fisherman now than to play on the PGA Tour or to ride a damn horse at the Olympics. Think about mm. that for a minute. Like, we're like, the this is the most expensive sport, period. Maybe besides NASCAR. Like, I, I don't know. Like, like, what is the message you're sending to these kids? That like, by the way, like, yeah, if you want to do this, unless your daddy's got rich pockets, you got to find people because unless you have six grass on the front of your boat, you got four on the back, you got a brand new boat because if it's three or four years old, we're not gonna let you run it. Like, like, and I think panoptics is cool, but do you need $500,000 worth of grass on the front? And, and like, that's where it's like, the, and it, no matter what you thought of it from a, my business brain, it's the optics. The optics are from a marketing standpoint is you want the flashy shit. Also, you're telling everyone else is unless you have all this, you can't compete. Yeah, it, it is. It's a message that you don't really have have a goal or conclusion. Uh, you know, the good little guy playing playing, uh, you know, peewee football says, hey, I want to go and I want to be a professional football player. Well, at some point during his career, he realizes, hey, I can't play professional football. So I'm going to you know, stay in school. And maybe if I want to get involved in professional football, I can go ahead and get involved and be an agent or, or something else or work in it. So in bass fishing, it's, it's different because we keep dangling that carrot out there. And when we run out of carrots, we just keep adding more carrots. We come up with a whole salad they can go after. We, you know, mm -hmm. you fish this league, you can win 10,000. You fish this league, you can win 20. And if you qualify for that, then you have a chance for the big, big prize, a stuffed pepper. You know, so we're, we're dangling all this stuff out in front of these kids, but it really is. It just. Uh, it is a shell game. It is a little bit of bait and switch, and it's every kind of con game that you can think of. And I hate to put it that way because I have so many really good friends who fish tournaments, but I see so many more tournaments. And now, with some of the rules saying, "Hey, you can't just fish the three tournaments in your division," which is going to save you some money because you can stay local and you know be home every weekend. No, you got to fish nine. You got to go all the way across the country, and that that's to qualify for that that pizza, you know, that we're all trying to get mm -hmm. out there. So I wonder what is the final message? What is the goal? What are we, what are we telling these kids to, to strive for? And we are starting them in college and high school, probably start setting them up before that. So we've got it going, it's going. And at the same time, that new group of anglers is coming up. We're taking that, that top level, the tournament level, and we're raising the ante We're we're, it's going to cost more and more money. And mommy and daddy are probably willing to say, hey, you know, we're going to support you for a few years doing this. And they can go out and be a little bit more reckless, whereas the pro that's got to go home and, and take that long drive home to see his kids and his wife and say, you know, honey, I don't know how, whether I should be doing this next year. You know, maybe there's something else I should be doing. And then what do the sponsors do? Who do they sponsor? They sponsor little Johnny, who's uh, who's been he's a good fisherman, but he's only going to commit to it for one or two, three years. He'll get distracted by some other shiny object and he may be gone. So is this good for the sport or is this really a sport at this point when the anglers are dumping so much of their own money into it or their mommy and daddy money and the sponsor money? Who benefits? How does this work? Mm -hmm. No, I mean, that's, that's a really good point. I mean, it's funny because like with the high school and college nowadays, like qualifying is extremely easy. When I fished college, you had to qualify to get to the regionals and then you had to qualify in regionals to get to the national championship. And now like it's, it's so easy to get to a national championship. And it's like with the BFLs where they reset it, like, well, as long as you pay your entry fee, you get to go to like the regional. It's like, then what's the point of even having these tournaments to qualify? And I don't know if it's because you just want to give everybody a blue ribbon for like participating or they get more money, but it's like, what's the point? It, it, in like, 
Forget the ribbon. They're getting more money. I mean, they bring the money to the sponsors. This, you know, that the tournament organizations really have a great business model. You know, they're they're the casino. You bring us the money, and we'll we'll decide who the winner. We'll have you come across the stage. We'll weigh your fish, and then we'll give you prize money, and we'll take a cut out of that. And then we're also going to let the sponsors advertise and and let the guys wear their jerseys with the sponsors on it. I mean, there were some tournaments, If I don't know if you guys remember, where if your sponsors didn't line up with the tournament organizer sponsors, you had to put tape over it. You had Ranger to boat, it. right? FLW right. back in the day. You had to wear somebody else's shirt, you know, over your shirt. It was just the funniest thing to see. People going, why is he wearing a Hawaiian tropic shirt over his, you know, Skeeter shirt? You know, why is that? And, and and again, for a while, there have been various stages to this. And, uh, you know, I've been around it the, since the beginning. And there have been various stages when you had you had sponsors that would you know get out there and you almost had teams like you had Skeeter team. And I said 20 or 30 years ago, what the boat company should do is put together their own team and compete against the other boat companies and mm-hmm. put together the top guys that who they think are the top guys and pick out the best fishermen and go out there and perform that. But it has to be a TV product, which is why I thought maybe ESPN could do that. Maybe that uh, Major League Fishing could do that. Um, FLW did a pretty good job uh, under Erwin Jacobs with, with their product. It was a, a, a good TV product. Uh, uh, Charlie, Charlie, who was the, the host? Uh, Charlie. Uh, but Charlie was, Hartley? Uh, Charlie. Charlie. Um, no, Not the, Hartley, right? No, no, Charlie the uh, Evans, Charlie Evans, Charlie Evans used to be the MC of the FLW events. And uh, so you guys are really trying to draw all this out of an old guy's head, you know, and usually just falls out. But I try to draw it out. Uh, Charlie was great as a host. It was pretty exciting to watch the weigh ins. Mm-hmm. They, they had these fish tanks, uh, the weigh in tanks. It was pretty cool. You put your fish in this aquarium. And you kept adding your fish to this aquarium. You could actually see the fish swimming around and they'd hit the button and weigh the aquarium and the water and the fish. And that would be how they how they determined the weight of the fish. So it was kind of exciting for the crowd. They had, you know, T-shirts they would shoot out into the crowd. I mean, the, the Bassmaster Classic has always been an exciting event and they have people. But when you have the Bassmaster Classic and you have it in in February, you have wiped out most of the country. And as an advertiser, I have to either agree with that or I'll have to spend money in the other part of that country to reach those people. Because if mm-hmm. you go to a Bassmaster Classic, you I mean, everybody that comes to that thing, they drive and you're not going to have people from Minnesota going down. You're not going to have people from Maine going down and you're not going to have people from you know, maybe Maryland might come down. But you lose a lot of the fan base. And I that's where the money is. So you, you want, you know, it's viewership and the fans are, are basically viewers. And those are the ones you want. So you can add some value and some incentive for advertisers to spend money with you. And everyone, we I promise we'll, we'll get to the Potomac River here eventually. But the oh, one really? question I do have for you is Mar- uh, California. Like it's Bass Talk Live talks about that a lot. How how Bass Bass Masters specifically have shunned them. Really, I think it was since like Aaron Aaron Martin, you know, God rest his soul, won out there on uh, Havasu. Like, is that also getting to your point where it is they really focus on one specific part of the country? Because there's got to be a there's a great following of, of bass heads out in California that they are financially or for some reason they're shunning. Yeah, uh, guys like John Murray. I don't know if you guys know who John. I didn't know who John Murray was 20 years ago. And John Murray was one of the guys 20 years ago that made more money in bass fishing than than a lot of guys out in California because they don't they don't play for for money. They play for cars, RVs, houses. They they had a, a really good tournament thing going there and a lot of a lot of gunslingers out there, really good ones that were that were fishing out there. And I think a lot of the anglers just said, you know, going from California to all these other places is a long way. And maybe the tournament organizers said the same thing. We got to take our buses and our cameras and our lights all the way. So they kind of have kept it regionalized. Of course, it's a matter of who will pay to have them come there. Uh, mm-hmm. If you pay, they will play and they will show up. And uh, that again, what a great business model. Yeah, let's see. You know, I'll take my tournament to your place so I make money. I'll let anglers participate so we make money. 
And they don't really have to go out and sell this. They have people begging to be in front of these in audiences, uh, whether they're at the classic or just you know, in the magazine or, or whatever Bassmaster is doing and adding value to it. So it's, you know, and it's really a shame because I really would like to see this as a sport, but I don't, you know, every year I just shake my head. That's what I'm doing now. I'm shaking my head. And I don't see it getting any better. I don't see the sport getting tighter and tighter. It's getting bigger, broader. It's getting diluted a lot more. And as a fan, as an advertiser, diluted audience and diluted fan base doesn't doesn't help me. It's funny because I told one of my friends, if you tried to describe to an alien all the lakes we fish, they would think there's only six lakes in this country because like we're going we're going to Lake Hartwell again. And it's like you don't understand, like at least when I fish college tournaments, we'd go to like Kiwi. We'd go to, to like, you know, uh, Clark's Hill. Like there's like what, three or four lakes on that chain of rivers, but you only go to one. And it is a shame because like there's so many more fisheries. And that's why I kind of liked MLF at first when they went to those little lakes in North Carolina. I was like, oh, my God, this is new. Yeah, like, this is cool. crazy. And it's like, but then they went right back into the cycle. Let's fish the same four lakes. And and you're right. You're you're 100 percent right. Damn, I'm not used to hearing that from a from a guy. <laughs> <laughs> now, and I believe me, you know, for everybody's watching. I'm a huge fan of professional bass fishermen uh it's it's an amazing thing that they that they do uh you know i have been on a boat with hundreds of them uh interviewing them watching them fish talking to them uh using them in you know columns i consider a lot of them my close personal friends and yet i i feel for them i know their families i know their kids and i go this is you know they're they're not doing well in the sport from not what they've done it's just how other people have come in and made it harder for them to compete for a very narrow portion of some advertising dollars and the prize money. I mean, you know, how many tournaments can you win, you know, in, in your career? Two, three now, maybe if that if you're having a good, good career, you two or three. Uh, and if at the top levels, two or three, I mean, you know, not many, not many people can do mm -hmm. that. And how many sponsors are willing to say, you know what, we're going to continue to pay you more. And this last gas hike was a big example of that mm -hmm. in the old days, if gas prices had gone up or somehow expenses had gone up, you could have gotten your sponsor and say, hey, I, I couldn't get a cheap hotel room. It cost me an extra 50 bucks. And they'd go, ah, no problem. Well, gas prices doubled. I mean, doubled. And anglers are having to make decisions. And pros are going like, well, do I fish all these tournaments here or do I do I go home or do I just go on to the next tournament to save gas? And and they go to their sponsor and, you know, they go, hey, you know, can you help? Well, you know, they can't they can't really help you out. So they're forced to make other choices. And some of those choices include not fishing as much or working other jobs related to the industry and, and trying to make up the difference. What do you think, and you don't have to, if you, you say what you want or say nothing at all, it's fine. What do you think with this recession? Cause it is a recession guys, spoilers. Um, <laughs> what do you think it's going to do? The, what do you think it's going to do to the uh, industry? Because I remember when the housing crash happened, I've heard people that I used to listen to uh, say that that really shook up the industry when the housing bubble crashed. Do you foresee something like that happening again right now? Well, OK, first, I, I, I've got to reveal that I was a financial talk show host uh, in, in Washington, D.C. for uh, for 12 years. So that's all I always talked about was money and what it does. Uh, people who have money during a recession, they get hurt, but they also see that they're going to recover really well. So now you got other people, new people in that may not try to weather this storm, uh, number one. But also being in a recession, I think that a lot of advertisers are going to are going to pull back a little bit and they're going to tighten their belts. And that's what big companies do. They when they get through a recession like this, they tighten their belts and they come out of it. Hey, they're lean and mean. They're they're ready to go again. So uh, short term, I see what's what's happening. And, yeah, I, this is a recession. You know, no question about it. Uh, and we're seeing belt tightening in, in corporations across the country. Um, and we're going to start to see it with with the anglers as well, whether or not they think they should put their careers on hold or is this a good opportunity for them to do something different that's a lot more stable? Uh, those are questions that, that they're going to have to answer. And uh, I think it's going to result in, in fewer people and losing a lot of the, the better people, the older people.
I think yeah, like okay. Nolan Miner too. He jumped into the kayak where he can spend two hundred fifty dollars on the entry fee and win ten thousand. Doesn't have to worry about the fuel in the kayak, you know, things like that. But you know, I still challenge. I think I think you know you got people buying from fifty thousand to eighty to hundred thousand dollar boats, and they just keep turning these things over. And like you said, if you got the money, you can afford it. But even if you don't, just the, the amount of we tra- the thing about bass fishermen is we travel. Like you're going to travel. You're going to hook your boat up and you're going to travel great distances and spend thousands of dollars in lodging and food just to be able to chase a fish. That's what fascinates me is everything is going after a fish. And I think the industry is strong. I don't think I mean, I think you will have some people change. But the cool thing about fishing, too, is it's not just done on a bass boat. Uh, There's other avenues and other ways. And and you're talking about the difference to tournament fishing. But. Uh, there's so many people out there and it is a form of gambling. You're right. You're going to, you're going to drop 80 bucks to enter the tournament to, for hopes to win three or 400. And you've spent, you've gone down there for two days. You're still, if you, as a businessman, that never is going to equal right. When you look at your expenses um, and we, we somehow think, Oh yeah, I won 400 bucks, but you really didn't because of, yeah. of how much your equipment cost and yeah. how much you spent at the bait and tackle shop even. Yeah. Well, the, the other thing, yeah. even, even with the kayak, even with the kayak fishing, they've got to travel. They got to take time off work. And during a recession, you know, I wouldn't be going to my boss and going like, "Hey, we know things are tough with the company and everything, but you know what? I got to take an extra couple of days off to fish this kayak tournament or a John boat tournament or whatever it is." You're going to see a lot of people say, "No, I, I got that's the job I got to protect this chasing the fish thing." I realistically can't do that, or they're going to find themselves, you know, maxed out on the credit card. Uh, Mm -hmm. And as interest rates go up on those, there's another noose around the neck. You know, they're going to they're going to be in trouble because of that. And uh, I think whatever the whatever the sport you're in, like bass fishing uh, in particular, when you're spending money to make money, you're traveling to make money. And in a lot of cases of these guys taking time off from work to make money uh, as a bass fisherman and that money is shrinking and your expenses are going up. It's not, it's not very inviting. It's not selling yeah, and, that. And, and, and the counter to the counter there is, I think there might be an issue with tournament fishing, but I think the recreational fishing should be fine. Because if you think about the demographic that actually fishes, a, a majority of them are retired individuals who have a set income. I think the idea of you going to the lake and fish, if COVID proved anything, I think recreational will be okay. It's the tournament. Like, are you going to dump 50 grand in to pay a $5,000 HFE for eight tournaments? Don't know. Will you still go to the lake with your family? Probably. Yeah. Well, I, I, I have a unique experience that, you know, as a guide, I get to fish with people who I I wouldn't even call them recreational fishermen. They're fishing is entertainment for them. Mm -hmm. And not one of them. I'll ask them, Hey, who's your favorite pro? Uh, oh, they have pro fishermen. They've heard of pro fishing, but they have no idea. And they can't name a single guy. I'll throw out Mike Iaconelli, and they'll go like, yeah, I think I might have heard of him. A lot of recreational anglers perhaps are a little bit more in tune to the bass fishing because they're buying more stuff. And they're buying stuff at the recommendation of, of these of these guys. And hopefully they're reading some of the articles. Uh, that's the other thing, part of the industry we don't talk about. There aren't many very good bass fishing writers out there. They're still, they're just a handful of them. Uh, magazine is, magazine industry is not doing real well. So you have a lot of the older writers that have been doing this for a long time. They've kind of bowed out of it. So you have just a few that are willing to work for less. And some of the older guys are just going like, you know, I'm not going to do this anymore. I mean, I... I've been in the writing part of this for a long time too. And I, I quit some when they, they would come back and go, Hey, uh, we want you to keep doing what you're doing, but we're going to ask you to do more and we're going to pay you less. And at some point, you know, being a member of the outdoor writers association, Southeastern outdoor press association, where we, we sit back and we go like, I don't want to ruin it for the next guy to sell myself short so that the next guy coming mm-hmm. up is going to be working for nothing. Uh, if they think they can make me work for nothing, what will they do to the new kid coming up? So I just go, no, I'm not going to do it. And I've walked away from paychecks because of that. And you hit on something earlier, too, that I'd learned in a marketing seminar that, you know, when you talk about competition, too, like whether it's a bait and tackle shop, we're not competing against the Dicks and the Walmarts and the 
different things so much as you're competing against the dollar. And so that extra money that you have, where do you spend that money? And I think that's the thing with anglers too. Anglers and hunters are all the same in that that is our passion. That's what we enjoy doing. And so we're going to find a way to do that. We'll sacrifice a lot of different ways so that we can still take that money. If that's what we enjoy doing and we're going to spend that time and money. And so for me, it's almost too, it's more of the pursuit of maybe that win or that big bass or, you know, new personal best, whatever that is for each person at that stage in their life. I think the bass fishing industry, I think they are providing that platform for all people. It's kind of like softball or, or Thomas can relate to this too. And, and you were talking earlier too. I think all sports are guilty of this travel sports anymore. I don't care if it's, if it's baseball or volleyball yeah. or any of them, we have this perception that they're going to come knock on your door. This, this big school is going to knock on your door and say, here, I'm giving you a free ride to come play football. It's not going to happen. Like it's one in a million, but yet we make all these kids believe that they can do it when it's not going to happen. And so I think it's a problem across the board, but the difference here is these, these kids, kids, college or whatever, it is something that they can do um and pursue it does it mean they're going to make it to the top probably not but that's true of anything in life the higher you go it's going to dwindle yeah. down the percentage is going to be less but you know what they have in common is that schools high school college use those kids in those sports they mm -hmm. use those kids to make money and the professional bass fishing circuits are using the the fishermen to make money too. So it's, yeah. it's, and it's, sorry, it's the way it is. Is yeah. it wrong? It's up to you if it's wrong, but mm -hmm. without admitting that that's what's going on, then we can never get this thing solved because it is college football players. Should they be paid? I mean, the schools are making money off of them. Uh, mm -hmm. Should, uh, should professional bass fishermen get paid? Well, the, the tournament organizers are making money off of them. But instead, it's the other way around. The, the college student is giving up everything, giving up four years of their life and, and chasing this ball dream. And the yeah. angler's giving up two or three of their lives chasing that uh, that green fish all around. So I, I, I can speak from this from a baseball perspective when I got my scholarship. And then I had my first of three reconstructive shoulder surgeries. And, you know, the school dropped me. And guess what? They didn't have to pay for my health and my medical bills. I lost my scholarship. Like, mm -hmm. so I do think from a college athlete perspective, they got to figure something out because if you are like an Alabama lineman and then you bust your knee, you're screwed. They're not going to flip the bill for you. Mm -hmm. And I do think in that sense, yeah, they need to do a better job on the other sense. Like what Steve is saying from a business standpoint, being a guy that for 15 years taught kids in Northern Virginia, you know, baseball and athletics, Parents will always spend, regardless of good times or bad times, on their children. And I think mm -hmm. the bass industry has finally caught wind of that. And that's why they're putting so much into high school and college from the cynical side of things, because they know that's what's going to get them through the, the, the bad times. Um, and I think what's weird, and Steve, this is a good question for you right now with, with things are going. I feel like we're in a bubble, though. I think Northern Virginia, the Potomac River, the Shenandoah, the Upper Potomac Guides, is this going to be a bubble where we're not going to get hit, hit as hard because of of DC and the government jobs compared to if you were a guide or if you fish on like Lake Gunnersville in Alabama or in Arkansas? Oh, absolutely. I mean, no matter where I go in the country, I go, Hey, they go, where are you from? I go, I'm from uh, wonderland. You know, I'm from uh, Northern Virginia, uh, you know, Northern Virginia where your house goes up anywhere from 4% to 10% where unemployment's never, you know, never above 1% uh, where, uh, you get a cost of living raise every year and a, a raise uh, based on inflation. And you never have to worry about losing your job. You work for either the government or you work for a contractor for the government. I don't see, I, you know, and we raised our rates this year and I don't see it slowing down at all. We raised our rates basically because gas went up and then it, gas came down. We didn't we didn't lower our rates back down. You know, people were just willing to pay without without worrying about it. So, yeah, we do. And we get people that come to the area to, to fish. Uh, they come here on business, but they're they maybe from Texas. They always wanted to fish the Potomac River. So we haven't seen that. Um, I, it'd be interesting to ask. I'm getting ready to go fishing with uh, Matt Miles. I go fishing with him uh, on the Upper James and uh, Lynchburg area. It'd be interesting to see what happens with him because he has upscale clientele as well. I mean, I really have. I mean, a lot of my clientele are, are just unbelievable people. I mean, they're 
Um, I met a lot of really cool people when I was in radio, but I've met even cooler people in fishing. You'd be surprised who bass fishes. It's it's not, you know, it's not us. <laughs> it's, it's people that have a lot of money and have a lot of prestige, you know, people in politics and sports and in uh, and, and movies, and yet uh, also people in high finance business. Uh, it's been, it's, it's a really cool thing. So no, we're not going to get hard. I see that perhaps other ones are. Um, I'm always curious to see what other guides charge when I go, uh, across the country and, and we charge a good bit, but there are some in Texas that charge a good bit of money too, but, um, our expenses are a little higher on the Potomac, I think than most others, because we have to have a Coast Guard captain's license, a Maryland guide license, Potomac River Fisheries Commission license, a commercial insurance and the whole bit. Um, but no, we haven't really, we haven't taken a bite. It's, it's, it's been pretty good. And COVID, COVID slowed us down only because of Governor Hogan in Maryland who pulled a bonehead maneuver. That stay at home stuff was absolutely mm -hmm. ridiculous. Uh, we're going to stop the spread of COVID by keeping you from going out on your bass boat by yourself to go fishing. But if you want to go fishing in a kayak, you could do that because that's a form of exercise. Oh, if you want to fish for food, you could do that. Well, I have a kayak license. I can mm -hmm. do what hundreds of bass fishermen did. They blend a little bit. Wait a minute. Mm -hmm. I can just put a bass in my live well. And if I get stopped... I could say I was fishing for food. That's right. I am fishing for food. And they did that. They put bass in their live well. And guess what? That whole period of time, they did not write a single ticket for anybody fishing illegally or boating illegally. So COVID hurt us because they shut us down for almost a month and a half, two months, right at pre-spawn. And that was a killer because... You get people that plan and then they they stop. And that that whole year was awful for us because people didn't know where they should come out. We were getting people saying, hey, we want to see your vaccine card. And, you know, and I'm like, you should be looking at my insurance card more than my vaccine card. And I told people, I said, look, we're going to be out there. These boats go about 70 miles an hour. If you get COVID from somebody on that boat going 70 miles an hour and COVID can handle that, we're all going to die. We're not going to have a chance, you know. So that hurt us more than the economy, even while at that time we saw the economy starting to show signs where when you shut down a business for a week, two weeks, three weeks, three months, four months, a year, and then you tell people they can't go to work unless they have a vaccine or don't have a vaccine, then you have, you know, you have a, a complete zoo. And now you got the CDC going back and saying, oh, well, you know, we maybe made a mistake on this and mask and no mask. It was a bad, it was a bad time. And it impact that impacted us more than anything I've ever seen in the industry. You know, Steve, too, I was when you're talking about your expenses and stuff or how much it cost. I always compare this stuff to like the old MasterCard commercial. So, you know, four hundred dollars for a half day, you know, trip, guided trip, and you know, two hundred dollars for a rod and reel combo and line and you know, ten dollars for a cup of coffee and donut and twenty-five bucks for lunch. And but to go fishing on the Potomac River in DC with Steve Chaconis, priceless, right? <laughs> And the experience yeah. is great. And it's like, and what is that? What's the value? What's that worth? And I'm telling you, you can't put a dollar. And it's like, you know, when we took these kids down there to this tournament in Gaston and a lot of us will camp out and, you know, we got the boats pulled up there on the, on the water, uh, beached on the land there. And it's just that, the, that days, those days, that experience on the water with those kids. I mean, it, it is, it's literally priceless. You can't put a price tag on it. And, and to your point, you still got to be able to afford it, but, um, you know, this pursuit of the fish thing, it's got me fascinated, regardless of your tournament or, you know, recreational angler, you're going with a guide or you're, you're jumping in your kayak, however you're doing it. You know, I, I don't think, I think you're right. They might slow down, but I think, you know, I think it's that pursuit of that. That's what, that's what drives us. And I think it always has, and I think it always will. Well, and yet, it's Jared, whole, yeah. it's a whole oh, experience. Continue. They get on my boat and they go, what's that smell? And I go, that's. <laughs> fresh fiberglass. Oh, <laughs> I've never smelled that before. You know, how fast will this boat go? Well, it'll go about 70, but we're only going to go 40 today. You know, uh, it, it's the whole thing. And I remind the other guides that I work with, I, I tell them, I say, look, just like I did in radio, when you get people coming by the radio station for a tour, that's our workplace. 
you know, they're like, ooh, a microphone, ooh. You know, well, the bass boat is the same thing. The bass fishing, everything is cool. You open up a rod box and there's all these rod boxes with colorful rod sleeves and you pull out lures and you start showing them which lure you're going to use. It's an experience. It's entertainment. Uh, right. It's right. supposed to be fun. And that's the way a lot of these people look at it. I yeah. don't take out the guy who says, I'm a tournament fisherman and I want you to show me spots. I don't take that guy out. I, they go to some, fish with somebody else. Uh, I like those people and I've done it before, but it's just not something I enjoy doing. Just cruising around going like cast over to that tree stump and you know, pitch over to that clump. And OK, now let's go to the next creek, you know, and do, you do that all day long. I take out people and I make it fun. I make it a lot of fun. I talk to the fish. Uh, I, you know, I'll, I'll goof around with it, with the people. I, you know, I flirt with their wives and their, uh, and their daughters and, uh, and, uh, you know, but I've done some things. I've got some stories of stuff that I have done in the line of customer service that I wouldn't wish on anybody. You That'll be for the after hour special. <laughs> so that, 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 I tell you what, I, I tell people some of the things that I've done and they go, I don't think I ever want to be a guide. No, that just does it for me. Usually I tell people, you know, that you have to have a drug test to, to be a guide. That usually says, oh, I can't do this. But but when I tell them about some of the things I've had to do uh, for my clients and, you know, when you get older clients, they have issues and things happen. And um, so uh, it's, it is fun. It's entertainment. Uh, you understand that going in. I try to find out what people's expectations are. Uh, and it's it's kind of like what I do. I, I, I've been doing some YouTube videos and it's kind of what I do there. I, I tell them uh, what I'm doing while I'm doing it. And I've I've done that for 20. 25 years, 20 plus years, honestly. OK, I'm, I'm winding. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. OK, now I'm snapping. OK, I'm doing this. So I tell people that and I tell them that in the videos, but I'll also tell some stories like how did I figure this out? Who did I learn this from? Uh, I'll mention specific pros that I've learned stuff from uh, or tell stories about that or accidental stuff that I found or, you know, how it took me 30 years to figure out that shaky heads actually work, even though I had used them over a period of 30 years. I'm like, oh, OK, shaky head, you know, like uh, I don't know if, if uh, some of the viewers are going to know who Wayne Olson. Wayne Olson was a guide out at Lake Anna for mm -hmm. decades. And I knew Wayne Olson before that because he used to support all of our little league teams when I played baseball. Uh, in the Mount Vernon area. And, and Wayne was one of those guys that was always out there supporting us. So I said, Wayne, I want to write an article about you, uh, about shaky head. Do you, you use shaky head? And he goes, shaky head? What's that? And I go, well, you know, a little jig head and you, and you put a worm on it. And he goes, oh, jigging the worm. Yeah, I do that all the time. You know, so, you know, you, you get to tell stories like that with people and they, they find that they'll remember something. And what I find fascinating is when I get calls from people that I fished with 15, 20, 25 years ago, something will trigger a memory and an impulse where they've got to talk to me. They will call me up. They don't want to go fishing again. They just want to tell me something because of something mm -hmm. I said to them 15 or 20 years ago that they remembered that they were trying to tell the same story to someone they were fishing with and they wanted to make sure they got it right. So, you know, when you do that and I've been lucky that I've been in jobs when I was in radio where people get real personal. Um, when I get out there, I get real personal. Everyone knows that I have a dog. They all, everyone knows I got a cat. Everyone knows that, you know, I, everything about me when they get through the trip and, uh, and they'll know some of the, the stories that I tell that go along with it. It is a whole package. And I think in our area, because we do that, uh, we get a lot of repeat customers for the, for, you know, Tom, I know you're interested in, in the business end of it. What I tell everybody who's starting off in guiding that 10% of the people that you fish with this year will fish with you again. They may not fish with you again this year, may not be next year, but they'll fish again. So if you take out a hundred people, that's 10 customers that you'll fish with again. The next year you're going to have 10 more and then 10 more and 10 more. Mm -hmm. So after you've done this for about 10 years, you're booked. You're booked and you're going to mm -hmm. have regular clients if you treat the people right. And uh, I find that, unfortunately, some of the older guides 
don't treat women very well. Uh, and it, it really, really bugs me. Cause I, yeah, it's, uh, I don't know why, because I, I, I'm sure you guys have fished with women. I have fished with a lot of women. I have a lot of female friends, and that's the only thing. I, have. too, am married. <laughs> yeah, you're married. Sorry. Okay, nice. Uh, but I have a lot of female friends that, that love to fish, and that's the only thing we have in common. And I enjoy their excitement. I enjoyed the time that I spent with Christy Bradley 10, 20 years ago. We're still good friends. Uh, I love her to death. She's She's great for the sport. Talk about someone who's great for the sport. She She's came great. and uh, she just recently came and talked to our youth team uh, before we went down she, again. And yeah, she did a great job. Yeah. yeah, she's she's absolutely wonderful. Uh, there are a lot of other pro women that are really good. I have a lot of uh, of local women who like to fish. Uh, my nieces, they they like to fish. They're in their thirties and forties. But some guides are like, come here, honey. Let me show you how to do this. You know, and it kind of kind of reminds me. I when I go to these outdoor writer conferences, they have two groups. They have the hunters, they have the fishermen. And what they do is they try to mix us. So I got paired up with this woman who was a shooter. So we go out to the clay ranges and we're getting ready to shoot. And I told the guy, I says, look, you know, I, I don't shoot, so I don't know what I'm doing. And he goes, ah, oh, you're lying. Here is a gun. So I go bangity bangity. And so he goes up to her and he goes, Hey honey, uh, here you go. Let me show you how to hold the gun. She whipped out her, her uh, amber, I'll never forget, they were amber sunglasses. In one motion, she whipped them around, caught one ear, caught the other ear, and she goes, over, under, boom, 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 boom. She goes, keep them coming, rabbit, boom, 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 boom. And she was, she was, and I'm like, you work to learn to shoot like that and make sure I'm behind you when you do this. But, uh, uh, you know, so there are anglers, the older guides, I think, and maybe even some of the younger ones, they, they don't treat all of their clients with the same respect. I don't think anybody deserves more or less, but you know, when you treat people differently, that I think that's a problem. And I've picked up a lot of clients who had fished with uh, an older guide uh, on the Potomac river. And he was just flat out rude and, and nasty, very condescending. And, uh, and, and just not, you know, it's not good for the sport because women uh, spend a lot of money on the sport too. And women have kids and they're the ones that are going to pass this on. A lot of times dad doesn't have time and mom's the one who takes, it. I mean, look at it. You mentioned Aaron Martin's. I mean, Carol took uh, Aaron fishing, you know, saw that he had an interest in it. She took him fishing and, you know, look what happened. And she got into it for a while too, but she got into it because of Aaron and because somebody had to drive the boat and he wasn't, I think he was like 14 years old. He was good enough to take other people's money at the time, but he wasn't good enough, old enough to drive the boat. It, I think that's a really good segue into something we mentioned before we started the broadcast, which is the sharing of information and the tribalism. And I can tee this up for everybody. We're like, you have a lot of clubs that don't want to share information with the next generation. Um, I, I have personally, I, I usually try to extend an invite to anybody that wins a tournament that's local, no matter if it's like 10 boats or a hundred. And it's shocking how many people don't want to come on the show just to talk about it. And then I'm going to, I'm finish it up with the tribalism between species. Uh, if you guys don't know, um, I had the, the individual, uh, John Mulligan, who runs the DNR for Maryland Freshwater, and we talked about the flathead invasion on the Potomac. And we had a lot of very, uh, very wholesome comments in the comment section from uh, the catfish community and other people about that. And, and, it, and it shows this tribalism between like, I'm pro snakehead, I'm pro catfish, I'm pro bass. And it's just, it's insane. <laughs> I'm not on the show right now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I call it being a species snob in a lot of cases where you have bass fishermen that don't don't respect the other guys. But we've also seen uh, on the Potomac the uh, uh, the blue cat. I mean, blue cats are they're bad. Uh, they eat other fish. They eat what other <laughs> fish eat. They grow bigger and bigger and they keep eating more and more and they get, get to be giant. Well, the people who chase those. They don't want to kill them. They want to catch and release them. Well, the commercial people are harvesting millions of pounds of, of those things a year because they're so prolific. And when you try to say like, oh, we don't like the, the these uh, these blue cats, and then they'll point, well, you know, largemouth bass, they're not native either, you know. So we have this hodgepodge, and for people to get overprotective, overzealous in protecting one species over another, uh, I think I think that's that's an issue. When it comes to snakeheads, you know, the biggest problem we have in snakeheads isn't the snakehead. It's the guy who catches the snakehead and takes it to another fishery. Uh, we yeah. see a lot. We call that Johnny apple seeding where they, they take a fish and they move it. I mean, we talked to John Odenkirk or, or, or Joe Love yeah. with Maryland, John Odenkirk with Virginia. 
um, they're they're definitely concerned. That's the biggest concern about, about these fish because they're easily transported very easily. In Virginia, we have Alabama bass, Alabama bass, and uh, they pose another problem where you've got now uh, a fish that will mix with the local fish and the dominant gene will be in the Alabama bass. So you'll have a highly prolific, smaller fish that eats a lot and it'll kill your lunker size fish uh, in that in, in that fishery because they just won't have anything to eat. Eventually they hybridize and you end up with this Alabama freak that's, uh -huh. that's out there. Um, so you have a lot of that, but you also mentioned the, the clubs and you know, I've been to club. I used to go to a lot of clubs and do seminars, but now everything's on zoom and I have to make sure that when I do these now, my message is, Hey guys, you know, taking 20 bucks in a pot tournament with 10 boats and not sharing how you caught them, you know, and not bringing in younger kids and, and working with them. In fact, Maryland has a program where if you're a tournament director and you're either your tournament director or your assistant director is a Maryland resident and you're having a tournament and that tournament is predominantly young people, uh, I think under 16 years, you can look on their website, but under 16, they'll, they have a $500 uh, allowance that they'll allow you so you can purchase weigh-in stuff. Well, they'll purchase it for you, but it's kind of an award they give you. They say, hey, you're having a tournament. They just did this with Mike Iaconelli's uh, tournament where he, uh, uh, yeah. where the Ike Foundation was on the Upper Bay. They applied for it. They got a grant for a shoot where they shoot the fish away. Uh, but a lot of a lot of these clubs, they they don't work with the kids. They They don't work with them. They don't share information. I was doing a seminar and I was saying, I was saying, well, this is a drop shot and, you know, to the guy that posted in that thread that threatened me about mentioning drop shot. I'm really sorry because there was a guy that, on that same thread with your catfish. They said, yeah, Steve, we're coming after you if you talk about drop shot. Well, I'm going to risk it. I'm going to risk it. But I, I was I was I was t telling them that this is how you cast it. Uh, and then you shake it like this and you close the bale by hand. After you make your cast, you make sure the lines in the line roller. And this guy's writing all this down. And I'm like, you didn't know that? And he goes, no. And I go, who do you fish with? I fish with you fish with him? And he didn't tell you that? And the guy's going, no, hey, I didn't tell him that one. I like seeing him snag all his line up. You know? So mm. simple stuff like that just to make things better. Because, you know, we only get better if we raise the bar of competition. And you can do that either by going out and competing against better anglers or bringing other anglers up to your level. So you're going to all of a sudden one day turn around and look back to the guy that you taught and all of a sudden he's landing the biggest fish of his life. And somewhere you better be smiling. You better be smiling because mm -hmm. you you're you are part of that experience. And that guy now will remember to reverse the roles and pass that on to somebody else, too, because that's really the way it survives. We. You know, when when the um, uh, Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation uh, set up their their programs, uh, Take Me Fishing program, mm -hmm. the Take Me Fishing program said, oh, you better take them fishing while they're little, because when they grow up so fast, you'll never get to fish with them again. Well, that was great. Didn't last long because mommy and daddy didn't have time to take them fishing when they were seven and eight and nine and they lost interest anyway. So it never happened. They learned very quickly to go after college students and high school students, because again, they're going to graduate and they're going to get jobs, whether they're not, they don't have to become present, uh, professional fishermen, but they're going to keep fishing and they're going to spend money. And that money is going to be good for the sport. That's going to bring more stuff into the sport. It's going to bring prices down. It's going to be uh, innovations that are coming out. I mean, the, the stuff that the, everything, I, every time I turn around, I see better, better hooks are better. Uh, jig heads are better. Uh, I just uh, used a, a powder coat called Stardust. I'd never used it before. It's, I used to, I used to powder coat jig heads and you have to bake them in the oven. And my wife would come in and say, Hey, I'm, I'm either going to cook in that oven or you're going to use it for, for your jigs. And I, Okay, honey, uh, fire up that pizza, whatever you're cooking, because I'll cook these jigs somewhere else. But, but new stuff coming out, you find out about it, you hear about it from, from other anglers, you share the stuff through clubs. Somebody, I went to a tackle shop, and I, you know, and I don't, it's not because Jake's is involved in this program, but I got to tell you, the local tackle shop, that's where, you know, you can, you can go, and somebody took exception the last time I did this show. And I said, hey, you know, you don't get very good service in the big box store. They don't know as much. Well, 
this guy took exception to it because apparently he works in one of the stores. And there are some very good people. In those I stores. That comment, actually. There are, there are. <laughs> but there, everyone in the local tackle shop is really good because somebody's looking over their shoulder saying, mm -hmm. you better be good because we want this guy to buy everything in the store. And if you're not really good, that's not going to happen. I find the tackle shops are more in tune. They listen to the guides. They listen to local fishermen. Uh, they they have all the local magazines. I know they have Woods and Waters in, in a lot of these places. And and uh, and they also have seminars. They invite people. Jake's is, in, you know, unfortunately, because of my schedule, I haven't been able to work it out. But Jake's is inviting me and other people up to, to do seminars. So that's that's something you don't and it's very intimate. You know, you don't have to sit there in line with 500 people. When I used to do seminars at Bass Pro Shops, there'd be like crowds and crowds of people. And if you wanted to ask a question, you're kind of like intimidated. But you go to a store like like Jake's and they have little seminars there with with a guy. There may only be eight or 10 people sometimes on some of these weeknight deals. They, they're there and you could go like, hey, look, nobody's around now. Can you teach me how to tie a knot? You know, mm. You know, so you can learn anything that you want. You won't be embarrassed to ask that question. So I think, you know, from where you started with this, Thomas, if you're a club, please, you know, dial it back a little bit. Uh, I, I gave advice on on Facebook. Some guy was new to the area and wanted to join a club. And I recommended a club uh, that one of the clubs that I really like is New Horizons. I've known uh, Charlie Taylor. I've known him for 100 years. I mean, Charlie... Charlie and I, I think the club members just like to hear Charlie and I reminisce about old baits or, or people or, or whatever it was because we've both been around this market for a long time. But that club, they want people to learn. They share. Mm -hmm. I, listen, I, I go to their, I do their Zoom stuff or when I was doing them live, I'd sit there and listen to their, their minutes and they'd say, okay, uh, Joe, you won that last tournament. Uh, what were you doing? Uh, well, I was throwing a Senko. Yeah, well, you always throw a Senko. How do you rig it? Because we throw it, we don't catch them. What color were you? So you get that sharing in there, whereas some of the other guys on this Facebook thread were saying, oh, join this club. They got great tournaments and this and that. And I said, guys, look, you know, if you want to join a tournament organization, there, there are those. But there are only a handful of the ones that really like to see people succeed and enjoy the sport. Right. That's if they right. keep coming back. And those are the clubs that you go to those meetings and it's the same people there with a few new, new faces. They're growing in size. They have more and more members because people are getting more than just fishing out of that club. A huge count. shout out to Charlie. Yeah. yeah uh, hold on. I just want to say, Jared, like a huge shout out to Charlie New Horizon because it was them that got me into fishing. They used to put on little derbies for kids out of Lake Fairfax. Yes. And they were bank fishing cool. tournaments. I, you know what? I might've actually seen you there. And I was like that little kid. Cause you, cause you had to get your cardio in. Cause you had to wind sprint when you caught one to get it measured and yeah. everything. So you got, you got your running in too. So it helped with the obesity and you learned how to fish. That's but it. if it wasn't for those tournaments, I wouldn't have gotten into fishing. So new horizon is the shit. I'll link them in the episode description. Cause I need to have him back on. Cause yeah, they, they are. Sorry, Jerry. Yeah, go. Wait, no, yeah. you, you had him on the show. Right? Yeah. You yeah. Yeah. I love, I love Charlie. Charlie. Sometimes we forget that, there's a, you know, I'm there to do a seminar and he and I'll just start talking about, you know, who knows what it is, but they've, you know, David Smith there, I think he's the president now. Uh, everybody there is eclectic. Uh, 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 John uh, Crunkleman, he paints, you talk about someone who paints baits, Crunkleman, he, he can paint baits and he's painted a lot of baby one minuses. I gave him a baby one minus to copy that I had picked up that I have never seen that color. I picked that bait up, actually it floated by when I was wading the Shenandoah River before anybody wow. was using a baby one minus. And it was the only one I ever had. Before then, we were shaving the lips off of our bomber baits so they wouldn't die. We were actually just taking a file and, okay, that seems to work. That works a little bit better. You know, we would file the lips off because we didn't want to have a deep bait. And then the one minus, uh, I think Danny Moorhead came out on the Potomac River and did real well with that. And then all of a sudden that became a bait that everybody had on their uh, box. But John paints baits. Uh, David collects crank baits and, and, and buys and sells crank baits. So it's a really cool club. It's more than just, mm -hmm. hey, we're fishing a tournament. And uh, for those, yeah, anybody looking for a club, it's, my opinion, the one there, there's one also fish on bass anglers in Maryland is a very good club. I haven't had much contact with them uh, recently. A lot of members there have changed, but uh, they're a good club too. You were saying earlier, and I would challenge, you know, talking about sharing information. 
it always amazes me how people, it's kind of like, what percentage do, do people learn on their own? Now, if you spend time on the water, you are going to start putting things together and learn. But I would challenge too, there's a certain percentage that you have learned from somebody else, your fishing partner or, or whatever. So that to your, to your point, you're exactly right. The information is shared and passed on and, and especially on YouTube I and mean, there's everything out there. And the other thing I find amazing with Thomas by doing that, allowing people to come on and talk. And again, yeah, there's a large percentage are laughing like, yeah, there's no way I'm going to come on and share my secrets. But the people that come on, what I love about it, though, when you're fishing the same tournament with them, what'd you catch them on? I caught them on a, on a bone, you know, spook or whatever. Is there a spook? And then I might have caught on a plopper. And then somebody else says, I caught on a jig and it was a green pumpkin with, you know, orange. Well, this guy caught it on, you know, a jackhammer. And it's all different. And it's, it's like, then it goes to show too, like fish are opportunistic for you to think that it was just the shaky head or just one thing. You're crazy. It's not always going to work that way. Yeah. It's, it's a wide I, I, I fish with a guy. I fish with a guy who every time I catch a fish, he has to, fe he feels like he has to switch to that exact right. lure. I'm not talking yeah. like category. I'm not gonna, I'm talking yeah. about color. Yep. I'm talking exact yeah. lure. Yep. And, and there's so much out there and it's how you fish that lure. Mm -hmm. um, I took a young kid fishing. Uh, uh, this uh, guy, a friend of mine out in West Virginia, asked me to take his grandson fishing. And he was 12 years old. And usually with 12 year olds, uh, you, you got to be real careful because they 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 think they some of them think they know everything. But you got to kind of just like every other guy, you know, you got to kind of break it to them gently. That they don't know a whole lot. Uh, so I start off the same way. I teach them casting. So I, you know, showed them a popper and that, you know, so showed them how to work it and, and that kind of, and, and then I showed him a, a, a baby one minus and he wasn't catching anything on the baby one minus. So I said, well, wait a minute, let me, let me get a rod out. So I pull a rod out and I start throwing the baby one minus. I start catching it. And he looks over and he goes like, uh, well, your, yours is different. Yours is a different color. I said, oh, hey, I can fix that. I cut it off, tied it on his, took his off, tied it on mine. And I kept catching them and I go like, oh no, do I have to cut it off and tie it again? Do we have to do this like all day? Or are you going to do this? That's all awesome. right. You know, are you going to, you're going to, do so, you know, you, you try to, you try to get that point across because there are subtle differences and that's the guy mm. with the Senko. How are you fishing it? It's not, if that bait was the only bait that would ever work, if somebody would have written a book about it, it'd be one page and it would be tie on a Senko and cast it. That's all I would say. And say there's only one way to rig it, you know, and you gotta cast it, and that's all you have to do. But there's a lot to the sport and it changes so much. A lot of those things you were talking about, all these different baits working on the same day, it could be different parts of the lake you're at. My part was muddy, your part was clear. And when I tell I tell people when they want to know, doc, doc talk can really hurt your head. I mean, it's like yes. first of all, are they telling you the truth? Uh, but doc talk can really mess you up. It, what, what you need to ask is like, Oh, how'd you do today? You did pretty good. What was the water temperature? What was the clarity? Like, uh, what kind of cover were you fishing? Um, uh, was the bottom hard? Was the bottom soft, you know, put together stuff like that. And that means more than saying, I caught them on a yellow, whatchamacallit, a uh, buff blooper, pisser, or whatever. So, you know, we've got to learn to ask the right questions. And then if you're lucky enough to be in the same boat with somebody, and they're catching them and you're not, there are two things to look at. Just two things. You look at their rod, the position of their rod. That tells you a lot about how they're working the bait and how deep or how shallow they're working the bait. And the other thing you look at is their hands. It shows you the relative speed and also adding pauses or burning or doing something. Those two things there, if you focus on those, that'll tell you maybe what he's doing that you're not doing. And that might be the reason. I, I fished with uh, uh, Jonathan. Let's see if I remember his last name. Uh, I'll remember his. Uh, Jonathan, he fished FLW. Uh, Newton, John, Jonathan Newton. And I fished with him up in uh, Maine. And so he and I were in the boat and we, we were both drop shotting. I was using his rods, his baits, everything. There was a co-angler. I'm not going to mention his name. He was an FLW co-angler. He's in the back of the boat. So Jonathan is catching fish while we're talking. He's just like catching them, throwing them back. And I'm not catching anything. So I stop and I look 
And what he's doing with his, again, hey, guy that's mad at me for talking about drop shot, I apologize. The second time, okay? So what, what, I, what I noticed he was doing, I was doing this with my drop shot. He was doing this with his drop shot. So I, I immediately I said, well, wait a minute. He's doing this. I'm doing this with my drop shot. He's doing this with his drop shot. So his bait was closer to the bottom, moving more horizontally, and mine was basically bobbing up and down. Well, I did that and started whacking him. The guy in the back of the boat, the co-angler, the FLW co-angler, the guy whose job it is to figure out what's going on with all the clues that he's getting from the guy in the front of the boat, couldn't figure it out. He kept changing baits. He kept changing, went to a crankbait, went to this, went to that, couldn't figure it out. And then he started to ask. And I said, watch his rod, watch his hands. So he goes, oh, he watches. his rod. He says, now what? I said, okay. <laughs> then I had to tell him I felt so bad for him. But if you do that, it's going to make you a no better angler. And again, these are things that when you're sharing information, that's pretty important. You know, were you dead sticking it? And a lot of times, if you're fishing with a buddy, someone you want to catch fish, and I, you know, I have a lot of friends that I grew up with that I still fish with today. I'll say, you know what? I, I was burning that when that fish ate it. You know, and then all of a sudden they burn it and they, they eat it. You know, or I was I was sitting there, you know, drinking a cup of coffee and I had that Senko sitting on the bottom and I was drinking it and I wasn't moving it at all. And, and then I went to see what time it was and I moved my hand and it pulled the bait and all of a sudden, boom, I got a bite. So, you know, my buddy then would put a watch on and see if that worked. But, uh, you know, it, it's a really it's a very subtle thing sometimes that you can share. I think what happens a lot of times the guys that really don't know how they caught their fish, they knew what bait they were using, mm -hmm. but they really don't know why they caught that fish. They don't know how they got that fish to bite. And, and I think that hopefully is the reason that they're not able to share information, but there are guys who they know, they know what the heck's going on and they just mm -hmm. don't want help. They don't want help. No, that, that, that is it's true. Go for it, Jared. How do you look at uh, – so this fall time of year is always seems to be difficult during the transition, coming Stay out away. of the pattern prior to, you know, winter pattern, that, that window, because there is there's, – there's no pattern certain times of the year this year because you'll catch one here and then one way over here because they're, they're moving around. Eventually, they'll establish into a, a set pattern. But what are you doing when it's, they just seem to be all over the place? How are you fishing for them? Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you. So I've been doing a radio show. Uh, I've been doing it the last couple of years and I do it. Actually, did my last one this week for the year. And I told everybody what happens this time of the year is what I call musical chairs. Uh, the grass beds have been the chairs. That's where everybody's been sitting all year long. Well, the grass beds are breaking up and it's not a, systematic breakup it's not like it breaks up it's like a clump here dies a clump here dies so i i tell people you got to look for the, the location the second thing that's happening is because that cover is breaking up the bait fisher are, are are moving away they're moving to harder cover they're moving into into the creek so there's this this transition your job is to make a quick decision are the bass and the bait still here and i just have to find those isolated clumps or are the bass gone because the bait fish are gone? So you have to really pay attention. See if you see any bait fish. That's the best way. Some electronics are pretty good. And, you know, some of the side scan, you can see bait fish, especially when the grass beds start to get, you know, decluttered, so to speak. So I, I like to go and, and fish hard cover. Uh, I'll fish hard cover, you know, this time of year. That's basically my main my main target area. I, I want to go to where I would go in the wintertime, and then I want to back away from that, and I want to go the shallower areas. Uh, for instance, a specific spot, Bellhaven Cove. There's a cove right below Bellhaven Cove, and it's a small cove there, and it's shallow, and it usually has grass in it. Now, when I, the fish start moving out of there, then I know that they're going to start to move into the into the deeper waters of Bellhaven Cove. But they'll settle in there first because there's also a lot of rock and there's a little bit of wood. Uh, so it's a place for them to relate to. So, you know, it's it's, uh, you know, follow the bait fish. You hear that all the time. The other thing you hear is the fat boys don't sit far from the buffet. Follow the bait fish. You'll you'll find those fish. So it is a transition time as far as the baits go. 
yeah, I love that baby one minus. Uh, I love to, to use it as a search bait. And, 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 you know, when it starts to tell me I'm in the right location, then I can slow down and fish jigs. I mean, you, you, the one, two punch with a one minus and a jig, uh, sometimes instead of the one minus, it might be a buzz bait because I, you know, might have better conditions for a buzz bait, you know, be able to cover more water, a little bit clearer water sometimes, uh, or different type of cover. I can run a buzz bait over and draw fish from a little further away. Uh, but that the second bait is usually, uh, uh, a jig. Sometimes it's a bulkier plastic, either a, a bulkier creature bait or or a beaver type bait. But that's that's pretty much it. I don't get I don't get too fancy, and I'm very aggressive. Well, I'll, I'll fish cover, and I'll fish it. You know, a bunch of pitches to it. Uh, in a lot of areas, you don't have much cover, and when you do have that cover, work it over, work it over really good, and also watch your tides. You know, the fish will tend to move up into cover. You know, and that's, you know, we talked about uh, all the electronics and yeah, I use LiveScope and I use it. I found that it's taught me more about things that I thought yeah. I already knew that mm -hmm. I didn't really know. And that's at high tide, I'd say, hey, go to the bank on a dock, go to those pilings that are closest to the bank. And yeah, there are fish there. But I think what happens is those docks, other people fish those docks. I found that out that all the docks that I fish, there are actually other people that when I'm not there, there are other people fishing those docks. And those fish hear the trolling motor, they hear the electronics, they hear all the other noise. And when you go right to where they are, they go like, not me this time, buddy, I'm moving out. And with LiveScope and my power poles, they've been very, very good at teaching me, those fish are there, but then they leave. And I, sometimes I've gotten there, put the power poles down, and then I put the live scope and I get ready to make a cast because I see a fish. And then that fish starts to move to the next piling. Then I look and look and they start moving to the deeper pilings. But it's a good place to start. Uh, higher tides go to the, the, the shallower pilings and then a deeper at, at when the tide gets lower, you go to the, to the deeper pilings. And that's that's always a good thing. I love the hard cover. I love the love dock fishing in the fall. It's just it's one of my favorite things. And don't forget punching. And I'm not talking punching grass beds. I'm talking about punching docks. What is that you say? A lot of dead grass collects on dock mm. pilings. And you have a grass mat right there. And the same reasons that the grass mats out on the main river are good to fish, they're even better on a dock because by that time, and, and why, are, why are grass mats so good? It's because, because they have decaying stuff in there. I call it a tennis ball pattern. If I see a tennis ball, in a clump of, of, of grass, matted grass, I know that stuff has floated in there. And it could be other mm. dead fish, it could be anything, decaying stuff. And crawfish are, are eating that stuff and they're in that grass. And the bass are just underneath and they're watching. They're going like, make a mistake in your mind. And, you know, and then you can punch those those pilings. And that's, a, that's definitely another pattern that I like in the fall too, because you still have enough sun. You still have enough shade under there for, for the for the bass to use as an ambush point, and they got the added benefit of having another food source above. Does that is that going to help you fish the Potomac now? Yeah, I, I think that'll help a little bit. Um, so we have a massive audience down in the Smith Mountain Lake Kerr area. Also, guys, huge shout out. We broke into the top 200 of all fishing podcasts in America out of the 3,000 podcasts in our thing. We're in two, we're in the top 200. But with that said, I have a lot of guys that fish lakes. And compare and contrast for people that aren't that, that didn't grow up on the rivers, the fall transition into September to October, is that the same? Do, oh, let me rephrase it. Does it affect tidal bodies of water the same as it affects lakes? Is it harder? Is it the same? Is it easier? Well, I, I think when you're talking the Potomac specifically, losing grass, that you know, we talk, and you know, why are we losing grass? Well, because the days are getting, you know, shorter and the nights are getting longer. They get less sunlight. So they're, they're, they're leaving. That is the biggest thing on the, on a tidal fishery is that those fish, they're not there on these big grass flats when the grass is gone, they move, they move. So they move to those areas. They spawn in those areas. They live in those areas. So the transition for us is they go back to where they came from. So that's why I say for, for me on the Potomac, it's going to the wintering places, going to smoots, going to spoils, going to uh, Possum Point um, in, in Quantico Creek, going to all these, these places 
and then backtracking, going away from them, seeing where where they're coming from. If if you don't know where they're stopping off, it's it's kind of almost like uh, release sites after tournament fishing. You know, pick the best spot when they leave that tournament. Pick the best spot, the most obvious spot. Start there. So that transition is 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 there. When you have lakes, you got turnover. You got water churning around and 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 fish getting confused and bait fish moving here and there. Um, to me, it becomes like a, a, a you know more stable water is shallower. So you uh, when I'm fishing lakes, I look for the shallower water because it is more stable. I'm looking for places uh, on my, my electronics where the bait fish are. Um, you know, I, I you know I find myself I found it kind of interesting uh, in conversations I've had with people about about electronics and they go, Oh, well, you know, you, you get all this electronics that makes a difference, you know, and you know, you know how deep it is over there. You look at your electronics and I said, well, did you ever think about asking me how I caught fish before we had electronics? Because I still do that. I have a clock. I make a cast. I, I don't know how deep it is on that first cast. I mean, I can look at my electronics. A lot of time I turn my electronics off. And I'll throw it out and my clock starts going 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004. That water is four feet deep. I'll make another cast over there and it goes 1,001. Wait, what happened to two, three, and four? Wait, has that fish got a hold of that bait already? Set the hook. So I have that clock. I don't know that, that new guys coming up have that clock. I don't think they have. We had to have that clock. We didn't know how deep it was 20 feet away. From, or 40 feet away or 60 feet right. away. We didn't know. We didn't have contour maps sitting right there showing us a little Bodhi Wodi on there and having a line drawing to a spot that said that is 40 feet away. You know, we didn't have that. And uh, so I rely, uh, I use electronics more um, to find things that I couldn't find before. I didn't know where the suspended bait fish were before, but now with live scope, okay. I can find them. So in the fall and in, in the lakes that I fish, I'm using electronics as an aid but I'm also going by things that, you know, traditionally have worked. Um, I think live scope really came into its own at, at Lake Fork, I believe it was during a tournament about Walters. Was, yeah. Mr. Walters yeah, wanted, uh, you know, everybody goes, Hey, fall transition. Let's go in the backs of creeks. That's where all the bass go. We got the book right here. And it says uh, fall transition backs of creeks. Well, somebody didn't believe that and went out and found fish with electronics and stayed on them with live scope and not only one, but pounded them. And every angler pro angler I talked to at that point had to make a decision art because only Garmin had live scope yep. and the guys who were sponsored yep. by Lorenz, the guys who were sponsored by Humminbird uh, had to make a decision. Are they going to let these other guys beat them with electronics or are they going to tell their electronic sponsor to, you know, sorry, I got to get this. Uh, and what a lot of guys did is they, instead of getting sponsored by an electronics company, Humminbird or Lawrence, they went to the sellers of the electronics so they could pick and choose what they wanted. Mm -hmm. And some of them stayed. I use Humminbird and Garmin. I, I like Humminbird for some things. You know, like Garmin for others, and uh, and I can get pretty much whatever I want, and that works for me. I, I like Auto Chart. I think that you know the Humminbird does a really good job with that. I like their side imaging. I don't use 360. I think the the Garmin kind of does that for me. Um, but you know, electronics have changed the way that we look at at fall fishing. So if you got a spot that looks good and you're not seeing you know a thermocline and it looks like it's gone and it's it's worth a shot. Take your electronics and go over and find some of that uh, that deeper offshore cover because some of those fish live there year round. It's very interesting that you say that. And again, like I'm not as as knowledgeable as you all when it when it comes to this stuff. But it, it was always taught to me that you know lakes in the fall are are insanely hard. You know, stop fishing, go hunt. But and then the reason I tie this back into the Potomac is this time of year is when you have so many regional tournaments and you have yeah. people that grew up just fishing lakes coming into town. And I feel like they overcomplicate it because I think fishing the river in the fall is way easier than trying to fish a lake in the fall. And I could well, be wrong. Like, what do you think oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, I fished a lake. I fished a lake today with with one of my clients. And uh, he said that was the toughest fishing he'd ever had. 
Um, you know, I, I caught them with probably 10 different, 10 different baits. I had to like, you know, try, and I knew, you know, I, I knew I had to do something. And so I was like, you know, saying, well, let me try a rattle trap and I'd catch one on a rattle trap. All right. Let me try a uh, Nico rig, catch them on Nico rig. Let me go with Ned rig. Okay. The wind picked up. Now I got to go back to a swim jig. And, uh, so you do all that, but on the river, I, I like I said, I'm one minus my buzz bait. Uh, you know, I don't even bother with a chatterbait a lot of times. I'll, you know, I'll throw, I'll throw a jig or, or a, a beaver or a creature bait, uh, and I'm looking for hard cover and it's shallow. I mean, these fish, they live shallow. They live in four feet or less pretty much 10 months of the year. Uh, they're in shallow water in a lake. You got fish that, you know, they'll live anywhere from 30 feet to three inches during the year. I mean, Certain times of the day, certain moons, they'll come up and feed right up on the bank. But those same fish, you know, on, the, on a different part of the, 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 the moon and different, you know, situation, weather, they'll go back out deep. The Potomac, they're shallow. And it's just a matter of where's the cover. And when that grass mm -hmm. starts to dissipate, it's no longer grass that you're fishing. It's hard cover. And that hard cover, I told you my favorite is docks, but there's riprap. There's riprap around there. There are bridge pilings around. There's shallow bridge pilings uh, on the Woodrow Wilson Bridge that are that are good from time to time. There, there are places in Smoot Bay with hard cover. There are places uh, at the mouths of Swan or in the even in the backs of Swan Creek. Uh, there's Piscataway Creek. You got a lot of docks there. You got docks in Doe Creek. Little Hunting Creek uh, is a little bit more complicated because it's not well marked and navigable, but uh, you can find fish in that in that creek too. You know. Spatter dock, you know, it takes a little longer to, to die off. So th there are fish that are, they're still holding up in there. Uh, again, those are high tide areas that you want to fish. So I agree with you hundred percent. I, I find lake fishing uh, and I haven't, I haven't done a lot of lake fishing until like the last four years. Uh, I started doing a lot more and I had, had, I mean, I know the techniques. I just don't know where the fish are. And mm -hmm. I, I think you have to make and so far, what I've seen with lake fishing is you have to make more adjustments. Um, and on the Potomac, yeah. it's just, you mm -hmm. know, you can hit them in the head. You can hit them in the head. And if all fails, you can use the drop shot. There it is, three times, three times. I, I do the drop shot again. You, can, you put it under a dock and do whatever you want to do. It. Is that guy, is, is he going to come after me, really? I mean. Uh, he, he, it, I haven't been on social media as long as y'all, but I've definitely found out that most people are going to just say nasty things online. You just yeah, because he it. I, I, <laughs> I googled him and he was an FBI agent and said he was going to raid my garage. I don't know. Not until you I tell the color. If you tell the color and how many inches and the, if it had flake in or anything, if you go that far, then it's it's on. But, and okay, who you voted for? Top shot, you might be okay. <laughs> Steve, okay. if you if you had a if you had one wish to change something on the Potomac River, what would it be? We'll, we'll have that as the last question. Last question. Well, how much time do we have? Uh, Actually, could, we could go till midnight, but <laughs> you know, I always, always, I guess, when it comes to any fishery and including the Potomac, I'd like to see us take better care of it. I'd like to see us take better care of our fish. Um, I people hate me. On social media, when I see a fish that someone has laid down on the carpet of their boat and said, look at this, I caught this fish and I laid him on the carpet of my boat. And I will subtly say to them, that's not really good for the fish. And then they start, I mean, the guy who, uh, who threatened you, I think he, he, he follows me around to all these posts I make. I see people <laughs> doing that and, and you know, and I try to explain it to them. I go, look, you know, they have a slime coat and, you know, uh, at a University of Florida, you, you got Mike Allen, who's the, the world recognized expert in, in largemouth bass. He says that, that the slime coat will, you know, if you take it off, it's kind of like removing skin and the, the fish will, oh, that fish swam away. You know, it doesn't matter that he swam away. He's going to develop a disease and he's, you know, it's not going to be good for that fish. That's if you care and really want that fish to survive because you could take five home and cook them. You could take five home and cook them if you want to. I'm just saying that if you really are believing in catch and release, there are better ways to do it. You don't, and I was not one who voted when I was with the Black Bass uh, Advisory Committee. I did not vote. I didn't vote against, but I didn't vote for the non-piercing 
coal clips. I didn't vote against it. I didn't vote for it <clears throat> because my feeling was if you used them correctly, you wouldn't be ripping a big hole in their face. Um, so, but you can use, I hate to see them when they, when they're weighing their fish, they put that thing in and, and they rip a big hole in the fish's mm -hmm. face. You can easily, I mean, you could mm -hmm. take any hook scale and I do it all the time. And I put a clip on the fish's mouth mm -hmm. and I put the clip on that scale and I weigh the fish that way, and it doesn't it doesn't hurt the fish. Learn how to when you're fishing all the senkos. The biggest issue with senkos is that most people kill fish with senkos. Mm -hmm. There's a very easy way to get the hooks out. I you know, and again, I I see it. I saw a, a dad with his kid. They gut hooked a fish, uh, and I saw it was gut hooked, and I said, "Sir." I, can I help you with that? I can really, no, I got it. What are you going to start insulting me in front of my son? You know, I'm like, no, but you know, I, I do this for a living and I've got hooked more fish than you ever got hooked. And I've had to do it and I can help you with that. But I've done some videos on it. Uh, I probably need to do another one on my YouTube channel, but uh, uh, on, on Maryland's uh, 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 Maryland DNR site, uh, we did a video and I explained how to do it, but it's pretty simple. You basically, the, the hook is in their mouth. You rotate the eye of the hook towards his tail. You put your finger on the eye of the hook. You put your other finger under the bend of the hook. And as you push the eye of the hook, you take your finger and you pull on the bend of the hook and it'll pop right out. No fuss, no must. No need to leave a hook behind in a fish. It'll come, it'll come right out. And the other thing that, that I'd like to see, this is a long wish, you know, it's a long, is that okay, Thomas? I mean, can I have like yeah, one more? Go part for it. Go for it. Yeah. Yeah. We have till 2 PM or 2 AM. 2 AM. Okay. Uh, Taking kids fishing, great idea. But do me a favor. When you take a kid fishing, make it all about the kid. Mm -hmm. Don't fish. You put a rod in your hand, you're a butthead. Sorry, is that butthead okay? Is that right? Are we okay with butthead? Yeah, you can say whatever you want. Don't, don't do that. I, I see that a lot. Dad's out there. He's, he's trying to fish. He's handed the kid a rod. The kid is tangled up, got a hook in the seat, doing, doing whatever. You take a kid fishing, make it about the kid. Make mm -hmm. anybody that you take fishing for the first time, make it about their experience. Make mm -hmm. it easy for them. Teach them all they can. But in particular with a kid, when the kid says, I'm done, that means they're done. You say, mm -hmm. great. Do you want to drive around and look at the electronics? Do you want to play? Or do you want to help me clean out my tackle box? Do you want to play around? Do you want to make this more fun? Make, make it, it fun. fun because mm -hmm. if you know, I, I have a lot of nieces and nephews and their parents don't fish. Kids love the idea of fishing. They really do. I'm not, I think it's the idea that there's something under the water and they get to see it. And, you know, they, they try to catch it so they can see it and touch it and look at it. And, and some of them want to take them home and you have to explain, well, you know, but, um, yeah. You probably just want to let the fish go and stay with his family and, and let him let him go that way. Um, but teach the kid, teach them, take your time, make the trip about them and enjoy the quality time and a quality environment. And everybody will have a better time that way. So that's that's my wish for the Potomac. Take better care of our fish and treat our fishermen a little bit better. Amen to that. Amen to that. Jared, you got anything else? No, I think that's good, Steve. It's always entertaining to listen to you. And how how long have you been doing it? How, many how long have I been? I've been guiding for 25 years. And um, I started bass fishing. You guys ready for this? 1965. I started and, bass fishing. And who got you into it? Who was your mentor? My dad got me into it. Uh, and, and my dad explained that the reason he took me fishing was so he could go fishing. And he did. He handed me the rod, and there I was. And I think he probably took me fishing. I started fishing when I was five. He took me fishing, and I saw lily pads at the edge of the dock. And I thought, well, I'll just step right on those and walk like the Flintstones, you know. And I stepped on went in, and uh, so I got wet. And uh, my dad and I then came to an agreement that there were things that I wouldn't tell mom what he did <laughs> he said right. he wouldn't tell mom that i did That's so right. i started fishing when i was five i started bass fishing exclusively and i i've never used bait for bass i've always used lures um i learned with a, a meps spinner uh meps 
I, we start with MEPS two, and then we found we could catch more fish with a MEPS one, and even more with a MEPS zero, and even some giant bluegill with that too. Um, but we also learned a technique that I still use today. It's called split shot, split shot rig. Um, not a lot of guys use it. They probably should. I used it a lot in guiding, and then I went to the drop shot four times. Sorry. I went to the drop shot a lot with my clients that replaced my, uh, and it was kind of funny to see me do this because I would, I would start off with, with the drop shot and we'd be doing the drop shot and I'd go, okay, now we're going to go to the split shot. I'd cut the, cut the leader off, take, take my, I, cause I use a bullet shaped split shot. So I use a bull shot and then I would just pinch it to the line above. And so all of a sudden I went from a drop shot to a split shot really, really fast, but that's what we grew up using. And the rods, the lines, the reels were, I mean, the reels were the old Mitchell 300s. They were bulletproof, but they're very, very slow, and they didn't really have a great drag system. Uh, the rods were all fiberglass rods, and they were like, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> so when I talk to people about frog fishing, and they go like, oh, yeah, how long have you been using a frog? I go, well, I've been using a frog since 1965. And I said, the question you should be asking me is, how long have you been catching fish with a frog? And that didn't happen until we had braid because try to take the old Berkeley uh, line, old Berkeley trialing, and try to use that with a one, 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 one fiberglass rod uh, when a frog, when you had a frog uh, bite and, and try to do that. Uh, I would take this, no lie, I would wind down as fast as I could and then I would run. <laughs> I would run trying to set the hook in those fish. And I'd run some of the lakes, I had to run uphill and I'd run uphill yanking on this fish. And he'd be, the fish would be jumping and jumping and they, they, they'd come off. But it would be like, you know, my dad said that's how I got to be so fast was, uh, was frog fishing. That's how I learned how to, how to swim. <laughs> Okay. So I told the football coach, you go, how'd you get to be so fast? And I said, well, frog fishing coach, you know, frog fishing. Yeah. So I've um, been doing it for a long time. I still like it. Um, I, I'd like to say I love it, but you know, I love people. I, you know, I like, uh, I like the sport. Uh, I love the toys. I mean, you don't want to look around in this room and, and see all the, the toys that I have. I, um, I love the lures. I like, uh, I like catching them on different things. I love, I love casting. Casting is something I just really, really enjoy i i cast either hand so it's uh it kind of blows people's minds when i'm teaching them i go what hand do you cast with and they go what do you mean i go well you cast with either one you know if you go if you're going to the left you cast to the left you go to the right you cast to the right you want to take a break you go up the middle you know but uh i've uh i've i've enjoyed it it's it to me it is a sport because it helps keep me in shape i'm I'm older than a lot of the guys that I fish with. And at the end of the day, they're all leaning over and they're grabbing their backs and they're, they're going, Hey, I got to sit down. I, I got to take my shoes off. You know, and I'm going like, yeah, I remember when I was your age, I wasn't, I wasn't messed up like you, <laughs> you know, and, and you have to, it's like sports, like John Cruz and a lot of other guys, they, uh, they work out. I work out. Um, you know, I do some weights. Uh, we have a we have a pool, so I swim a lot. I exercise, nice. bike, um, and uh, and treadmill. And uh, so, it, you know, I I'm pretty serious about it. And uh, I do it because I can't be out there taking somebody fishing and going. I need to sit down. Mm-hmm. Can I just take a break? You know, sometimes you know I I do it just for fun, <clears throat> where I'll sit back. I'll say, all right, now let me see you do this. And I'll have my remote for my for my Ultrex and I'll move the boat around, put the power poles down and I can watch them fish and give them a really good critique from where I'm sitting. And uh, But most of the time, no butt seat. When I have to use a butt seat, I'm going to have Thomas take me fishing. I, I don't think I'm going to I'm going to use a butt seat. So uh, Thomas, I know what the next segment is going to be Steve Chaconis and all things drop shot. Yeah, yeah. The all drop shot segment. All drop shot all the time. And we'll have a drinking drink. game. Yeah. Every time he says drop shot, take a shot. <laughs> drop every time he mentions drop shot, everybody takes an energy <laughs> drink. Uh one of the things when I did a seminar at uh at New Horizons a couple of months ago, uh, and they usually never ask me to do this, but they said, Hey, can you uh can you give a prize, uh, a, you know, random drawing prize to one of our members? I said, well, sure. What would you like? And they go, can you, uh, can you give away a bag of, of your, ce- uh, of your centipedes that you use for drop shotting on the Potomac? I said, sure, I could do that. So I, I, uh, cause I've been, 
I will we'll do that unless you want to hear it now, but I will I'll tell you my drop shot story, how I came up with my drop shot bait that I've used for you know 20, 25 years. Uh, I started drop shotting a long time ago on the Potomac when everybody said, uh, oh, it's deep, clear water, Japanese. And I'm like going, well, you know, I saw Rick Clun pull out a flipping stick with a drop shot on it in Matawoman Creek. I went like, and I tried it. I tried mm -hmm. it and I go like, I've got to do this. I didn't see him catch a fish, but the idea that he would even, I, it clicked. I went, I got it. Mm -hmm. I understand this thing now. And, uh, and that happens with a lot of things that that I watch, you know, because that's the way I think I'm a mechanic. You know, I, I think of things very technically. And when I saw him do that, I said, I got this. He he he's using this to keep his bait in one spot. And because uh, he had just broken off a Texas rig, went right back to that spot with with that. And I spent a whole year throwing the drop shot all the time. And I went from. Uh, six pound test in the winter time. I would find fish with a silver buddy, and then I'd start drop shot. Oop, I did it again, drop shot. Uh, I I caught him with a drop shot, and then the springtime I caught him with a drop shot, and then spawn came, and I started breaking them off on six pound test. I went to eight pound test, broke them off. Ten pound test, broke them off. So I pulled out a, a flipping stick with seventeen pound test on. I said, if Rick Clug can do it, I can do it. So I started drop shotting in in grass beds with seventeen pound test, and then braid came along, and then I started doing braid. And wow. the nice thing about braid is i can start and i use 10 or 15 pound braid now i could tie in the winter time a six pound leader or a five pound i use gamma uh, they make a, a a finesse uh like five pound test uh fluorocarbon so i'll put that on with my with my braid and then i'll as i need to during the seasons i'll beef mm -hmm. it up where i can throw 14 16 because 14 pound fluorocarbon you're not gonna you know you're not going to break that off, you know, not, not with a drop shot and a, a spinning rod, but yeah, we could do whatever you guys want to. I I've enjoyed watching these things and I've been, I mean, Jeff green, I mean, with shallow water adventures, I, I thought like, I go, should I ask him to be my agent? Cause he's like, he's on like every other week. And, you know, and I have, I have fished with the guy. He's a great fisherman, but every other week, Jeff green. Yeah. Yeah, so luckily we're going to be hopefully getting you guys. We're going to get him into the rotation as popular demand. We're going to get this guy right here, uh, Mr. Chaconis. Uh, you know, please, uh, everything will be in the episode description, but plug again. If people want to get out with you, I know you're a busy man and probably book for the next 30 years, but where, where can they find you? Uh, I have a website, nationalbass.com. Pretty easy, National Bass. Uh, YouTube, that's where I want people to start going because – uh, but before you come fishing with me, I want you to have some idea what you're doing. Okay. Uh, so watch it's the YouTube channel is national bass guide, all one word national bass guide. I have a lot of instructional stuff. If you guys like to tinker, I show you how I tinker. Uh, if you guys want to see how I actually do on the water and, and how I catch fish, I talk you through the whole thing. It's kind of like being a guide trip, but it's only like 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour. Sometimes instead of having to hear all the jokes, I cut the jokes out. OK, so I cut the jokes out of these uh, YouTube videos and, and I'm thinking about starting another YouTube channel where it's the jokes that didn't air on National Bass Guide YouTube channel. <laughs> uh, so but if you just want the fishing, it's National Bass Guide YouTube and uh, no jokes. I swear. I swear. And I, I'll even talk about drop shot. <laughs> Steve, as always, the man, the myth, the legend, uh, Mr. Chaconis. Guys, please give him a follow. Please help his YouTube channel. Let's push that Nike rhythm. Also, like and subscribe to this channel here. Uh, please get us to 2,000 subs. We are the fastest growing uh, podcast and radio show in the greater DMV metropolitan area. We'll see you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.